Hello, friends. Thank you for joining me today on this conversation about the new Renaissance, how art and mythology plant the seeds of reality. Today, we're going to talk about how art is not just art. Art is an expression of independent thinking and sovereign creative consciousness. And this applies both to our personal lives as well as the outer world. So today we're going to talk about the power of creativity to change not only ourselves, but to change the world. And we're going to look at the current meta crisis that is happening around the world today, which is a crisis on many levels from the economic to the political to the environmental. And ultimately, this, I believe, comes down to a spiritual crisis. And we're going to talk about the role of art and creativity and mythology in helping to heal the world today. And we're going to look at mythology throughout history and how mythology has been a tapestry that connects societies and cultures. And a culture's myths really set the tone for the laws and values of that culture. And many of the problems we're seeing in the world today can be traced to our disconnection from mythology and how society is so divided because we don't have the shared tapestry of mythology to bring us together and connect us. So I hope you enjoy this presentation around the new Renaissance. All right. Welcome, everyone. Most of you are probably familiar with the Renaissance, which was a time in Europe, primarily in the 1400s and the 1500s, where art and creativity had a significant influence on society. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, Western civilization in particular went into a period called the Dark Ages. And this was a time of dogmatic rule by the Catholic Church. It was a time of disease and famines and plagues. And it just, it wasn't the best time to be living in Europe. The world was not thriving at the time. And it was the artists, primarily in Italy, the artists and the philosophers who sparked a creative renaissance by remembering some of the ancient principles of art and science and mathematics. And they combined them all into new forms of creative expression, which gave birth to a flourishing culture in Europe for years and centuries to come. So I believe that we as a civilization today, I'm recording this presentation in the year 2023. I believe that humanity has a chance to embark upon a new renaissance and the power of creativity can help to heal the world that we live in and open up new, more expansive doors for the future of humanity. So we're going to be talking about art and mythology and how creativity is not just creativity. Creativity is a meme which plants the seeds of reality. And I want this to empower everyone listening to understand how potent and powerful their own creative expression can be when used with purpose and intention. I want to start by sharing a great quote by one of my favorite poets, Saul Williams. And this quote really summarizes the presentation I'm going to give today. I speak a new language, as is always the first sign of a new age. What Saul is getting at here is that art and creativity is actually upstream of culture. 
So in other words, when our words change, when our language changes, when our art changes, when our music changes, there's a downstream influence that these changes that this creativity has on culture. So if we want to live in a new world, in a new age, it begins by speaking a new language. We speak reality into existence. And art is a version of an amplified voice, right? Art is a language unto itself. So no matter what form your creativity takes, if that's writing, if that's art, if that's music, if that's business, if that's speaking, if that's coaching, if that's teaching, if that's leading, bringing that new language into existence is going to set the foundation for a new world that we can all live in. So one of the things that I have been primarily known for in my own creative career are the memes that I have made and shared on social media. These are just a few examples of my memes, but I want to bring this up because memes are very important to this conversation. And the way that memes spread, there is a corollary on how ideas spread in society. So what exactly are memes? We think of memes as being these funny pictures on Instagram, and they certainly are that, and they are an art form unto themselves, but there's a deeper meaning on what memes and memetics are. I actually go into this topic much, much deeper in another class called Meme School. So if you want to go deep into not only the history and science of memes, but how to make your own memes, go ahead and find that class and you'll learn how to do that. But for today, I want to talk about how memes are essentially viral ideas. The word meme came about in 1976, and it was coined by the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. And Dawkins came up with the concept of memes as a metaphor for how biology works and how genes replicate and spread. So if you look at a biological system, a gene reproduces itself and it spreads genetically. And if there's a gene mutation that is advantageous for that biological system, then that mutation will be the one that is carried on. And the memes and the genes that are not advantageous will eventually die out. What a, what a gene is to biology, a meme is to the world of culture and ideas. So the word meme is actually a combination of the, of the Greek word memema, which means that which is imitated, and the English word gene. That's how we get the word meme. And the definition of meme is an element of a culture or system of behavior that is passed down from one individual to another by non-genetic means, especially imitation. So in other words, memes are viral ideas. And memes are any idea that spreads, any idea that can be embedded and coded and shared through art, through storytelling, through billboards, through broadcast media. And the, and, and the more successful the meme, the more viral it goes and, and the more embedded the meme becomes in the culture. And I compare myths to memes because I feel in a sense, myths are the first memes. Myths are the ideas that took root and spread within a culture. So today we want to talk about spreading the meme of new earth. How can we consciously with intention and purpose, create and spread memes that are going to lead to a better world, a, a healed future. This is what I call the new earth. So it should come as no surprise to anyone that the earth is going through a bit of a crisis at the moment. Like I said, I'm recording this presentation in the year 2023. And everywhere you look, the world seems to be in crisis. A lot of un unemployment, there's, there's an economic crisis. 
there's a big political crisis, especially here in the in the United States, where there's so much division between different political factions. And we just seem to be a culture that's severely divided and in need of healing. The environment is in a crisis. You know, there's tons of species are dying every year. And there's just so much going on with the environment that we have not been good caretakers for. And we're starting to see a lot of those repercussions accelerating in recent years. And I believe at the core of all of this is a spiritual crisis. We are disconnected from spirit. We are disconnected from each other. So how exactly did we get here? It's similar to when there is a sickness or a injury in the body. You don't want to just treat the surface problem. You want to get down to the symptoms. You know, what is the root cause of this illness? We need to get to the root cause if we're ever going to heal the symptoms. So one way to look at this, and I've heard this from many people, that one way to look at where this crisis originated is if you look back through history, around 10,000 years ago, there was a big shift in humanity's way of living. And this is when humans made the transition from being hunter-gatherers to the creation of agriculture, where people became farmers. Now, on the surface, this does not look like a bad thing at all. It looks rather efficient. You know, when when you're living in tribal communities and relying on hunting and gathering for your livelihood, it requires you to move around. It requires you to never be settled. And you kind of every day had to go out and and hunt for your food. It was kind of like this ongoing thing you had to do. And with farming, it's a bit more efficient. You can grow big fields of crops. You can, you know, harvest those crops and you can feed more people. You can scale your food production, which allows you to scale your society. So instead of roaming around from place to place, this was where the idea of towns and cities and permanent establishments were was created. And the only problem with this is that for the first time in history, humans could own land. And not only could they own land, they could hoard resources. So we begin to see a slight transition from this kind of tribal equality into more of a hierarchical structure and you start to have the haves and the have-nots and at first it was a subtle differentiation but fast forward 10,000 years and the idea of ownership and hierarchy and hoarding resources has become more and more and more pronounced So to summarize this transition, we went from living in a community, which was a tribe that supported each other for our our own well-being, small tribes, and everyone had a voice within that community, into having more of a top-down control system. So from a circle to a hierarchy. And one of my favorite philosophers is Terrence McKenna. And Terrence McKenna called this the dominator ego society. So this is where the many are ruled by the few. And there are lots of this, the the, the dominator ego society wears a lot of different masks. So this manifests itself as colonialism, as patriarchy, as white supremacy, and things of those nature. These are all just, just different faces of the dominator ego society which was really, it's putting me above we. So we live in this in this society where the many are controlled by the few and, and, and the resources are being kept from the people by a select few who are hoarding and really controlling and nip, manipulating everyone else. And it, the problems that we face today are, are systemic. 
And it can be frustrating because we're just individuals, right? Me and you, we're all just individuals. And how can we as individuals fix systemic problems? Well, I think it's important to remember that all change begins in the imagination. In fact, everything that exists today from scientific breakthroughs to to the idea of democracy to inventions, everything that exists in the world began as a tiny seed of imagination. And in our hyper materialistic society, we tend to always want to fixate on the end result. Like nothing's real until it's built, until it's tangible. So we want to jump ahead into building things. And we do need to build things. We need to build better systems. We need to build a better world. We need to build better supply chains. We need to to build fairer economic systems, right? We do need to build things, but you can't start there. Before you can build something, you need to have a plan. And before you can have a plan, you need to have a dream. So this is the role of artists and writers and creativity, to plant the seeds, to plant the visions that can take root in the collective consciousness and spread like memes. So people can take those dreams, those visions, and plan them and eventually build them. So we don't need to know exactly how to get there. We don't need to have the plan quite yet. You don't need to build it quite yet. If you're an artist, if you're a creative, your role might be planting that vision. And when the meme of that dream can spread far enough, that vision will eventually become a plan and be built into reality. One of my favorite authors, William Burroughs, said this, artists, to my mind, are the real architects of change and not the political legislators who implement change after the fact. So you can look at it like this. Everything that we do, how we show up in the world, our very vibration, the words that we use, all the social media content that we create, how we show up in the world, we are always planting seeds. Whether we realize it or not, we are living memes. We're planting one seed or another. So the seeds that we plant there's a ripple effect on those around us and the words that we share and everything that we do gets implanted into the collective consciousness. And the future is what grows out of that. So every day we're planting seeds. The question is, are you planting seeds by default or are you planting seeds with intention? Art is a splash that ripples across time. This is another one of my favorite writers. This is the poet Allen Ginsberg. Ginsberg began writing his best poetry in the late 1950s. And at the time, his world, his America, was quite repressive. Um, He was a homosexual uh, Jew in New York. And... uh, You could call him neurodivergent. He was different. He didn't fit in. And society wasn't welcoming and accepting of him. Um, In fact, he was put into insane asylums. He was treated with electroshock therapy, which was just such a violent, primitive way of trying to set someone's mind right and correct them. So he was living in a time that was very repressive to outsiders. And at the time, his poetry was just okay. Uh, He came from a background where he wrote very traditional, rhyming, ballad poetry. And everything changed when he sat down in his New York City apartment and decided to, for the first time as a writer and as a poet, just really express himself fully to get all of the pain and anxiety and trauma out of his system. So he sat down and started writing the most brutally honest poem you could ever write, that he could write. 
And it was so vulnerable that he didn't even want to publish it. He just planned to keep it for himself. And it was basically writing as therapy. The poem that he wrote, luckily, ended up being published. And it was called Howl. And Howl became perhaps the most famous poem of the 20th century. And Howell was a meme, a seed that Ginsburg planted, because when people read it, it was shocking. It was so um, it was so vulnerable, and he was just going places that at that time no other poet had ever gone, and it spread and spread and spread, and the next generation of writers and musicians and poets took inspiration from it, people like Bob Dylan. So Ginsburg, and he had a kind of a collective of writers that was called the Beat Generation, and this included Jack Kerouac and others. So it became a bit of a literary movement. The literary movement of the Beat Generation went on to influence the generation that became the the hippies of the 1960s, which was this huge global cultural revolution. And it was an awakening of consciousness. So you could draw a line to just a few artists of the 1950s who gave themselves permission to open up and express themselves and to use art and creativity as a form of trauma release through through expression. You can release toxins in the body through sweating. You can drink ayahuasca and and uh, and purge that way. But there's a certain purge that happens through creative expression. So poems like Howl were a purge that gave others permission to purge themselves. And it became a ripple effect that expanded consciousness and opened a portal of love and radical acceptance and of sexual revolution that manifested in the 1960s as the hippie movement. So art is a splash that ripples across time. I love this quote. This is from Plato, um, the famous Greek philosopher in his famous book, The Republic. And he's talking about how music has the power to change culture. But music here, this this applies to any form of art. Musical innovation is full of danger to the state. For when the modes of music change, the fundamental laws of the state always change with them. That's a bold statement. So I want to touch on mythology. You know, we think of mythology as being this thing that really exists in ancient history. And now when we use the word myth today, it almost means something that's untrue. It's like, oh, that's just a myth. That's just a a, a lie, right? But there's much more to myth than just how we use that phrase today. Myths, I believe, are actually the bedrock of civilization. Myths are like memes because they are the stories which took root in a culture and spread. And it's almost like a shared agreement at the heart of a civilization. And myths are typically stories. So they are not literally true, but they are figuratively true. And they point their finger to a higher truth that maybe can't be expressed other than through metaphor. Because we live in a time today that's very hyper-rational. And and, and unless something can be almost scientifically proven true, it's disregarded. And I'm a believer in science. I believe in proving things true scientifically as much as we can. But I don't believe that the scientific tools we have today can be applied as a measurement standard for every form of truth. I think that there is a truth in poetry and in storytelling and in art that is just as true as the truth expressed in science. It's just using a different language. So throughout history, myths have been 
one of the things that have held societies together. Um, they're the stories and beliefs at the heart of a, of a culture. And it is from mythology that our values, that our culture, and that our laws actually stem. So it's like mythology is the roots and our values and our laws are the trees that are growing from those roots. And when the root, the roots of our mythology is healthy, it means our values, our culture, and our laws will be healthy. But when our mythology begins to decay and atrophy, as we are seeing today, then the values, the culture, and the laws will also unravel because there is nothing holding them together. So what are the myths that are at the heart of our culture today? And I live in the United States. This is where I grew up. So I am speaking primarily from a Western civilization, Euro-American point of view. And the myth that has shaped my culture in particular over the past thousand years plus is the myth of Christianity. And when I say the myth of Christianity, I'm not making any comment on whether or not Christianity is literally true. I'm not making any point around that. It doesn't matter if it's literally true for the sake of this conversation, because its effects are true. Its effects are real. It's the bedrock of many of the elements of the society that we live in today for good and for bad. You know, if you look at the courthouses in the United States, um, this has started to change. But up until recently, every courthouse in the U.S. had the Ten Commandments either hanging or engraved in that courthouse. That's how closely our myths were connected to our laws. And this is starting to unravel. This has actually been unraveling for a long time. And the myth of Christianity is it's kind of no longer holding us together in the way that it once did. And I'm not making any value judgments on whether that's good or bad. Um, like most things, I think Christianity is a mix of good and bad. I think that the heart of the teachings is very positive. It encourages love and forgiveness and mercy. And the values presented by Jesus are good, strong values. But at the same time, Christianity has been used throughout history as a tool of suppression, of war, of violence, and it has not always been good for everyone. And now we're really seeing that this myth that's really been prominent for 1,500 years, I mean, 2,000 years, but you know, it really started taking off maybe 1,000 years ago or 1,500 in 1880, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche made this famous and provocative statement. He said, God is dead. And he had a flair for the dramatic. So this was quite a dramatic statement. What did Friedrich Nietzsche mean when he said God is dead? He did not mean that some literal God had literally died. You know, the language of myth is more subtle and nuanced and metaphoric than it is literal, right? So he's speaking the language of myth here. And what he meant was, well, we as Western civilization had turned our attention and our beliefs away from this common idea of God. And, he, and Nishi said this in 1880. So this is so much more true now than it was then. And just like a myth, you know, you, you can't you can't remove a myth from a culture and expect it to keep thriving in the same way. When your culture is built on the idea of God, and even if that idea of God has been co-opted, which it has, right, and been used for all types of nefarious activities um, by people in power, even then you can't extract this idea of God and expect your culture to keep thriving in the same way when what it's based on has died or we no longer have that shared belief in it. 
So this leaves us in a bit of a crisis. And if you look at the world today and what is being taught in colleges and you know what's driving a lot of literary and artistic criticism in the world today really the the predominant myth that's being pushed in our universities today is the idea of postmodernism so postmodernism is kind of a philosophy based on the idea of almost anti myth so it's about deconstructing the past. It's about deconstructing old narratives and really questioning everything and saying everything is relative. You know, this was a famous art museum piece from a few years ago where someone duct taped a rotting banana to an art gallery wall and the banana gradually decayed. And the idea is that everything is relative. So the Mona Lisa is a beautifully crafted painting but it's no better than the rotting banana on the wall because there is no standard to measure yourself by because everything is relative and there's no unifying truths and it's a complete denial of the transcendent. So it's kind of a myth that's based on being an anti-myth. And you can see this in painting and in art. Um, the artistic movements of the 20th century, people like Pablo Picasso, it's all deconstructivism. So it's like Picasso created cubism, which is it's just deconstructing reality. And you're almost seeing multiple perspectives at the same time because there's no unifying truth. So I'm not completely opposed to the idea of postmodernism because I think that myths do run their course. I think that we are right to question the myths of society when they are not living up to their ideals, right? When the idea of God and Christianity have been co-opted and used to abuse and marginalize people, we are right to question them. So I'm not completely opposed to postmodernism, but I don't see postmodernism as being an answer unto itself. Because deconstruction alone does not a culture make. So what we see today is this. We are all living in our own disconnected reality bubbles. And we are united only by our shared outrage and confusion. This is a great quote from Terrence McKenna once again. And this is from a lecture that he gave, I believe, in 1990. And he is talking about the role of art to get us back on track. In a way, it's the poets who have failed us because they have not provided a song or sung a vision that we could all move in concert to. So now we are in the absurd position of being able to do anything and what we are doing is fouling our own nest and pushing ourselves towards planetary toxification and extinction. This is because the poets, the artists, have not articulated a moral vision. The moral vision must come from the unconscious. It doesn't have to do with these postmodernist movements in art, deconstructivism, and this sort of thing but that art's task is to save the soul of mankind, and anything less is a dithering while Rome burns. Because if the artists cannot find the way, then the way cannot be found. So this is a call to all artists, to all creators. What we need is a new myth to believe in, to bring us back together. We need a new cultural meme. Now, this can feel like a heavy task. How the heck are we supposed to create new myths? You know, myths developed and evolved over hundreds of years. It's a lot to ask just to create a new myth or a new cultural meme. So where do we even begin? Well, Terrence McKenna provided some insight into this. He said... When a culture gets into trouble, what it does is it instinctively goes back through its own past until it finds a moment 
when things seem to make sense. And then it brings that moment forward into the present. So there is a historical precedent to this. After the fall of Rome, we went into the Dark Ages. And this was a time when the Catholic Church really ruled with a heavy hand. And this was the time of witches being burned. And anything that didn't follow the the strict doctrine of the church was persecuted. And how did we get out of the Dark Ages? Well, it was the artists and the philosophers at the time who looked back into their own history to the last moment that made sense. And they rediscovered the principles of antiquity in ancient Greece, known as the classical period, which was a thriving time of culture and created the Greek empire. And they looked at the art, the philosophy, the mathematics, the science of the classical period, and they resurrected it for the age when they were living. And this is what we now know as the Renaissance. Renaissance is the French word for rebirth. And it was the rebirth of classicism into the modern age. And this led to a flourishing of culture, first in Italy and then across Europe. This led to the Enlightenment and the principles upon which the United States of America was founded. So it was really, it really was the art, the philosophy, and the innovative thinkers who looked back to in the past and created a renaissance by bringing some of those principles back to life. So McKenna, speaking of the time that we live in today, said, we must now reach back into time for a new cultural model. Our crisis is so great that we have to reach back to the high Paleolithic, to the moment immediately before the invention of agriculture and the creation of the dominator ego. So in other words, if the dominator ego that we talked about earlier is the prime source of all the chaos and unfairness in the world today, we have to look back to the moment before the dominator ego came into existence and learn the lessons that have been forgotten from that period. And the same way that the people in the Renaissance took the ideas of classicism and ancient Greece and resurrected those for modern times, we need to look back to our pre-agricultural ancestors for the insights and the principles that we can resurrect in our world today. And Terence McKenna called this the Archaic Revival, and I call it the New Renaissance. So what exactly does that mean? What is the New Renaissance? What do we have to learn from the pre-agricultural people, the hunter-gatherers? What are the, the lessons that we can resurrect in today's age based on the pre-ego dominator society? So it's it's kind of merging the ancient past with the future. So this doesn't mean returning to living as hunter-gatherers in huts and caves, but it does mean restoring the idea of community and tribe and living in small groups and supporting each other and relying on each other. It's taking those principles, but blending them with the technology age that we live in today, integrating the past with the future. This is sort of like there's there's a Native American myth of the eagle and the condor. And the idea is that there once was an eagle and a condor. And the condor represents the indigenous communities that essentially stayed the same. So this is like primarily in the Southern Hemisphere, where a lot of the indigenous traditions have been kept. The eagle is more like Western civilization, the people that that pursued progress and that went off to create the technology and the innovations that have led to modern society. And according to this myth of the eagle and the condor, you know, neither one is right or wrong. Um, certainly a, a lot of our progress has come at the expense of 
the environment and other things. But we don't need to throw out all of the progress that we have made. We just need to integrate it with more sustainable systems that are rooted in community and connection and spirit. So it is in the merging of the ancient past with our technological future that I see as the intersection of the new renaissance. And I've created a few principles that I consider to be part of this integration. And these are just five or six that that I came up with. There are certainly more, and I encourage everyone to think about this themselves. You know, what does it mean to integrate the past and the future? You know, what does it mean to have a future that is ancient? What does it mean to resurrect the ideals of hunter-gatherers and of community in our society today? I invite you all to think about your own principles of what that might mean, what that might look like. And I'm going to walk through a few of my own personal interpretations of this. The first is simply a connection to nature. Everything is nature. You know, we live in a world that is nature, that is of nature. We are part of nature. You know, nature is the law of the universe. And the ego has suppressed nature in so many ways. And art has just become like a mental abstraction. So we need to reconnect with nature, both our own nature as well as the nature around us. And art is part of our nature. The energy of source creation moves through us. You know, you could think of it like the whole universe is a tree and and we are all as people, little branches that are growing from that tree and the art that we make and our thoughts and words and expression are like the little leaves or fruit that sprout from the branches. It's part of the same energy that created us. The art that we make is an extension of that nature. So really restoring our connection to the natural world. Also interdependence. You know, we live in this age of hyper independence. People want to be sovereign unto themselves. And even in art history, you look at the art that's been celebrated over the last hundreds of years. It's this idea of individual achievement, like the Ernest Hemingway, who is this individual genius or Pablo Picasso, these people with big egos and their art is a manifestation of that ego. That's great art. I love Hemingway. I love Picasso. No shade, but we need to evolve out of that mindset. So the antidote to ego is community. So going from me first to we first. And this could mean changing how our art is created and consumed to be more rooted in community. I think the idea of the goddess is so important. And you could even just say the divine feminine or the feminine in general. And this is more than just women. This is the the idea of yin energy. You know, yin and yang are equal forces in the universe. And in our world today, we have prioritized yang, which is the action-oriented masculine energy. And yin has been suppressed. Yin is the receptive feminine energy where our intuition comes from. So this means that many women have been suppressed throughout history, but also the yin inside of us all, men included, has been suppressed. So we need to resurrect the goddess. We need to return the goddess to the rightful seat at her throne, restoring an equal balance between yin and yang, and really creating space and welcoming that yin energy into all facets of society. Social utility. So this means how can creativity and art not only be consumed, but how can they be more useful? So even looking at the Renaissance, the the first Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci is considered the greatest artist of the Renaissance, but he considers himself as a scientist as much as he was an artist. He was always looking for solutions to impact the world around him. So this is about reshaping society based on the principles of sustainability and community. 
and using creativity and art to actually help make the world work better. It's not just impressing people with our talent. It's it's solving problems, bringing creativity in to solve problems and make the world a better place. Techno Dharma. So this is a term that I recently learned, and this goes back to, I don't think that our technology is going to slow down anytime soon. So I'm not afraid of technology. I think it's inevitable, but our technology is outpacing our own wisdom. And we need to make sure we are building and using technology with integrity and mindfulness and purpose. So this is making sure that we are using technology, not the other way around. We don't want technology to use us. So as we use technology, as we build technology, as you post content on social media, you know, as the AI brains of the future are created, how can we embed these systems with wisdom, with intention? And lastly is the idea of consciousness. Consciousness is such an interesting thing. It's so big that it's hard to even fathom. Like what is consciousness? Because it requires consciousness to ask that question. <laughs> you know, what is consciousness? Where does it come from? So the prevailing doctrine in scientific communities today is that matter creates the mind. In other words, the universe is always increasing in complexity. That is the nature of evolution. Matter becoming increasingly more and more complex. And eventually, when matter becomes complex enough, consciousness just kind of randomly shows up. And that's how we're all conscious. It's a random consequence of increasingly complex matter. Yeah, I don't know. You know, consciousness seems rather vital to the whole thing, in some ways more vital than matter itself. So, so science and, and psychology and neuroscience are beginning to question that maybe matter does not create the mind. Maybe mind creates matter, or at very least there is a relationship between mind and matter, between the inner world and the outer world. Is this all a dream? Is matter just, is it the hallucination of consciousness to such a degree where we are dreaming the laws of physics into existence? It's possible, or maybe there's just some kind of relationship between mind and matter that we have not yet fully come to understand. And I love when new scientific discoveries go back to validate some of our ancient thinking, because this is a belief of shamanism. You know, shamans believe that to a certain degree, mind influences matter. And the spirit world and the world of consciousness is even more real than the world of atoms and protons. So I want to plant some seeds based on these principles and show how they can impact the story that we are telling through our own lives, through our own words, through our own art. So the old story says that we have to grind in search of achievement. The new story says that we ground in search of healing. The old story says that nature is a commodity to plunder and exploit. The new story says that nature is a priceless ecosystem that sustains us. The old story says that we must claim what we want with force. The new story says we reclaim the wisdom we have forgotten. The old story, the famous quote by Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am. The new story says that the body has an intelligence beyond the mind's ability to perceive. The old story says that we must constantly hustle to generate wealth. The new story says that sustainable systems regenerate value. 
The old story says that men are the rulers of society. The new story says that the goddess has returned to restore balance. The old story says that we must strive to fit into the box of social expectations. The new story says that our actions are aligned with purpose. The old story says that art is an expression of personal genius. The new story says that art is a gift and service to the community. So back to the idea of memes. The new story is the meme that you plant like a seed into the collective consciousness. Be the meme that you want to go viral in the world. How can your art, your creativity, your vision be planted in such a way where it can take root and spread? Everyone has a role to play in healing the earth. This includes artists. This includes you. All right. It is time for a creative playtime exercise based on creating the new renaissance in your own life and aligning your creativity with making the world a better place. So this exercise is called Plant a Vision. So everything that we make, all the words that we use, everything we post on social media, we are spreading a meme, whether we know it or not. Everything that we do and say has a ripple effect around us. So this exercise is about being very conscious and intentional about the vision that we want to plant. And this starts with imagining the world that we want to live in. So this is how it works. I want you to imagine what a healed earth looks like. You know, what, what does the ideal world look like to you? And everyone's vision is going to be different, right? Because we all have different desires. We all have different needs. We all have different interests. But blending a mix of the past and the future, imagine what a healed earth could look like. And this is how this is actually how the exercise is going to work. Choose a creative medium. This could be a poem, it could be a song, it could be a dance, anything you want. It could be a social media post. And we're going to use this creative medium to express a vision for the world that we want to see. This is our own personal vision of a better world. And this is not about making perfect art. We're just trying to communicate our vision and our heart. So don't worry about how perfect your art is. And then, if at all possible, I want you to share your vision with the world, with someone. You can either post it here in the community. You can share it with friends. It's one thing to get something out and write it down. And there's a certain transmission that happens when we write something down. We make it more real. But something becomes even more real when we share it in public. So it could be going to an open mic night. You could do this exercise with a group of your own friends and share with each other. So find a way to share your vision, even if it's with one person. And here are some things to consider for your exercise. What is your personal medicine for the world? What is the seed that you wish to plant in the collective consciousness? What does the world look like when natural balance is restored? What sort of social systems would you like to change? How does society look different when the goddess is no longer suppressed? And what is a story or myth that can help to heal the future? So I'm going to give my own example of this exercise. Um, this is a poem that I wrote in 2021, kind of at the height of the whole COVID shit show that we were living in at that time and that we are still um, living in to some degree. And I wanted to envision what a new earth might look like. 
So I wrote this poem and it's only one sentence long. It's a rather long sentence, but <laughs> grammatically it's only one sentence. So I'm going to read this now. This is called A New Earth. When the parasites have been removed and the oceans have been cleaned and the virus of fear of each other and ourselves has been blessed and transmuted by the great Amazonian grandmothers and we have shed the dead skin of history and the hyper-rational disembodied laws have been replaced by the organic regenerative decrees of nature. And we finally embraced our own magic and divinity and made peace with father death. And there's not an ounce of judgment left because we understand that judgment of another is judgment of the self. And every McDonald's has been turned into a garden and every shopping mall converted into a place of worship. And we celebrate each spring equinox by electing a single yellow daisy as president of the world in a symbolic gesture of gentleness and the futility of control. Then we shall wake up in the dewy grass of the new dawn and see our own reflections in the faces of each other and in the sunlight above. All right, have fun planting your own vision. Please post it in the group if at all possible. And uh, if not, find someone to share your vision with. Thank you.